John chapter 11 this morning, verses 1 through 44. This morning, what I want to speak with you about is the resurrection of Lazarus, the resurrection of Lazarus. In this passage, there are many things that we could focus on and, and dive into, but I think there are two main declarations, two overarching declarations, and they are essentially bound up in one verse, in one statement that Jesus makes. But these two declarations are intricately necessary, essentially tied together. They are bound together, and I hope you will see and be glad and rejoice in the Lord that these two declarations of truth are bound together. What I want you to see this morning in summary, you might want to write this down, is this truth that Jesus is the source and substance of resurrection life for those who believe. Jesus is the source and substance of resurrection life for those who believe. That means that Jesus is not only the one who issues the power to be raised from the dead and live forever. It's that Jesus himself is the power to raise from the dead and to live forever. He is both the source and the substance. He is the Word of God. He is God's powerful agent of action. By the Word of God, all things were created. By the Word of God, all things are upheld. And by the Word of God, the dead are raised imperishable, and the dead are maintained in eternal life. That is, the dead who believed in Jesus, raised from the dead and given eternal life. Those who do not believe in Jesus, they are, we've talked about this many times, they do receive resurrection from the dead, but not unto eternal life, but unto eternal torment, which the Bible calls the second death, a conscious, literal experience of the wrath of God forever. Not so for those who believe in Jesus. For those who believe in Jesus, he is both resurrection power and eternal life. The source and the substance of both resurrection power and eternal life. In this passage, we come to this point where Jesus has left Jerusalem. He left out the end of chapter 10 where the Jews were attempting to stone him, desiring to put him to death because he equated himself with the Father, calling himself by way of implication and declaration, saying, I am the Son of God. I and the Father are one. The Jews pick up stones to stone him. Jesus converses briefly. They seek to arrest him, and Jesus escapes their grave. Grasp. And he goes out into the wilderness to the place called Bethany, don't be confused, to the place called Bethany where John had been baptizing at first. These are two different Bethanies. Jesus is actually going to leave Bethany and go to Bethany. These are two different Bethanies. The one that Jesus had been at is the place, again, where John had been baptizing at first. This was about 13 miles to the northeast of Jerusalem on the other side of the Jordan River on the other side of the Jordan River. Jesus is going to leave that place, and he is going to come within less than two miles of Jerusalem, back to the south, back to the region of Judea, to the place where the people who are seeking to kill him reside. And Jesus knows this very well. In fact, his disciples know it very well and even push back on the idea of coming back to Judea, to the region where Jerusalem is. So we come to this passage, and it's a, it's a narrative record. It's a historical narrative. It, it is the record of an event that actually took place. And I would tell you that in my estimation, the sign, the miracle that Jesus performs here is his second greatest sign. It is his second greatest miracle. Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. 
You say, well, how could that be his second greatest miracle, to raise someone from the dead? Well, it can only be topped if you raise yourself from the dead, which Jesus does, in fact, do. In this passage, we see Jesus perform this sign of raising Lazarus from the dead. It is a preview. It is a preview, and it is a demonstration of the glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ, which he intends to demonstrate in the whole world upon those who believe in him. What Jesus does here for Lazarus is not merely for Lazarus' sake. Lazarus will die again. What Jesus does here for Lazarus is for the sake of belief. It is for the sake of belief. Because those who live and believe in Jesus will be raised up from the dead, imperishable unto eternal life. As Jesus is the source and substance of resurrection life for those who believe. Again, this is a narrative section of, section of Scripture. This is how we are going to be able to cover such a long uh, passage together, 44 verses. We're going to see it in three sections, and I've really organized it, as I see it here on the text, in three scenes. Three scenes. In verses 1 through 16, the scene is that Jesus hears the news. He hears the news, not that, Je not that Lazarus is dead, but that Lazarus is sick. Jesus hears the news. Verses 17 through 37, Jesus then encounters the family. After hearing the news and then hearing that Lazarus has died, he then encounters the family. And we read of that interaction in verses 17 through 37. And then finally, in verses 38 down through 44, the end of our passage this morning, Jesus comes to the grave. He hears the news, he encounters the family, and he comes to the grave. There are essential things, necessary things to point out in each of those sections. But again, I will make two declarations for you. I think these are the most important things for us to notice. Let's look at verses 1 through 16. Quickly now, it says, Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany. Again, Bethany is about two miles. It's actually a little bit less than two miles to the east of the city of Jerusalem. It's there on a hill, and as you are there in Bethany, you can look down that hill into the Kidron Valley and then up that hill, and you see the city of Jerusalem. In fact, when you are in Bethany and you are looking down that hill, you see many ocelots. These are boxes of bones. And in that area, there are tombs. Tombs where bodies would be bound, they would be wrapped, they would be spiced, and they would be placed in those tombs so that the process of decay could reduce the body down to bones. There are many people in that area, many people through the millennia who have died, and there's just not enough real estate under the dirt for everybody's entire body to be buried like we do it here. So they put them in a tomb and let their body decay, and what's left is the bones. They take the bones and they put those in a box, and they put the, these in the little grave sides there on the south side or on the, the west side of Bethany, rather, looking over into Jerusalem. Those who believe in the Lord Jesus right there, when he returns and he raises them from the dead, there will be a slew of bones coming to life right there on that mountainside. So it's there in Bethany, just outside of the city of Jerusalem, the city where the people are who are trying to kill Jesus. There's a certain man ill, sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. You heard about these two sisters in Luke chapter 10. It was Mary who sat at the feet of Jesus learning from him, and it was Martha who was cooking in the kitchen and stewing about doing it. She's irritated because Mary's not in there helping her serve and wait on the Lord. And Jesus says Mary has chosen the better portion. In this passage, we, we see somewhat of a reversal. We see, we see that Martha is the one who, Martha is the one who is to be commended, it seems. It was Martha, verse 2, or pardon me, it was Mary 
Mary, who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. All of these things being said to help us understand that Jesus had a very close relationship with this family. Jesus knew, was not merely acquainted with them. Jesus loved this family dearly. They were his friends. A certain man, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. The Mary and Martha that you know, that you've read about. Jesus was in their home. Jesus was teaching. They were serving him. They were learning from him. This is, in fact, even the Mary that you will read about in John chapter 12, the one who brings in the costly ointment, breaks it open, and pours it on the feet of Jesus as this tremendous memorial act of worship. She anoints his body, Jesus says, for death. And then rather than taking a towel and wiping Jesus' feet off, she uses her hair. Jesus has a, a close, personal, familial kind of relationship with Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. He is not indifferent to them or anybody else, but especially not to them. And Lazarus is ill. He's sick. Jesus, if you care about Lazarus and you care about their family and he's sick and you have the power to heal the sick, show up. Show up. And if you're going to do a miracle for anybody, wouldn't it be with those who you are so closely uh, connected and relationally friendly and familial with? Lazarus is ill. So, verse 3, the sisters do the logical thing. The sisters sent to him, about 13 miles to the north, saying, Lord... He whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Lord, he whom you love is ill. They know Jesus' relationship with them, and they're playing on that fact, and rightly so. Jesus, you, you love Lazarus. He's sick. The logical, reasonable response is to do what you can. Do what you can. We've seen you heal people. Do what you can for the one whom you love. Right off the bat, knowing the end of this passage, you begin to understand that Mary and Martha's understanding of what Jesus can do is limited. They think that Jesus can heal their brother. And they're right. But it has not yet entered into their mind that Jesus can raise him from the dead. Jesus doesn't need to heal him on time. Jesus can actually raise him from the dead. That idea, that concept has not yet entered into their mind. Verse 4, but when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to thanatos, death, separation of soul from physical body. That's what that word means. As you read the passage, you do clearly see Lazarus does indeed thanatos, he does indeed die. He does indeed die. In fact, he even begins to decay. Jesus just said this illness does not lead, it does not end up in death. Well, if Lazarus does indeed die, then how is Jesus' statement true? Because a skeptic could look at this and say, Jesus lied. This illness does not lead to death. Well, Lazarus did die. So in what way is Jesus' statement true and not fraudulent, not deceitful? Well, I tell you, it would be untrue if Jesus was addressing the ordinary, normal conception of death. The ordinary, normal conception of death is that it is irreversible. It is irreversible, and it is permanent. 
Jesus is combating here this idea, this conception of death that Mary and Martha and all of, her, all of their friends have. This illness does not lead to final death. This illness does not lead to a permanent condition. The skeptic doesn't understand that, doesn't believe that. This is why they would say Jesus is lying. But Jesus is challenging the human conception of the permanency, the finality of death. And he says... This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory, the praise, the opinion of God. It's that this illness, the purpose of it, it is unto your worship of God. God hath ordained the suffering, the illness, and yes, the death of Lazarus. Why? For glory for glory, for goodness. God has no problem claiming responsibility for ordaining suffering and death. He has no problem. I have no problem saying it either because God claims responsibility for it. Not only here, and not only in the passage I'm gonna read for you in a second, but all over Scripture. Remember the interaction that Jesus had with his disciples and the man born blind. John 9, verse 1 through 3, as he, Jesus, passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, teacher, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. This man suffered the entirety of his life without seeing the light of day. Why? For the glory of God. And Jesus declares it outright. He ordains suffering for glory. He ordains death for glory. You and I ought to rejoice in that. That means suffering has purpose. There is no more tormenting kind of suffering than pointless suffering. Moreover, even death is purposeful. It's purposeful. This makes it endurable. It makes it endurable, even death. It makes death endurable. That sounds paradoxical, but it's true. It makes death endurable because we know what the demonstration of glory is. The demonstration of God's glory is resurrection. It makes us able to endure death. What a strange yet peace-giving statement to be able to make. This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Jesus is not pulling any punches. He can, claims very clearly to be deity, to be the Son of God, that for which the Jews were trying to put him to death. Point to be made here. Why was Lazarus sick? Why was Lazarus appointed to die? through this sickness. Lazarus is sick and appointed to die through this sickness, not as a consequence of sin. Lazarus was sick and appointed unto death, not for sin, but for the glory of God. And I will make the argument for you that the death of a believer Jesus has transformed the reason for their death. In Adam, man dies as the consequence of sin. In Christ, man dies 
for the glory of God in the resurrection. That is to say, you and I, believers in Jesus, we do not die for our sins. When you die, you will die for the glory of God. You will not die because you deserve it, though you and I do. But that is not the reason. Jesus has transformed the reason for our death. We die for the glorification of God in the resurrection. Jesus died for our sins. We don't die for them again. You die for the glorification of God when he raises your, bed, your body. This gives us the ability to grieve, not as those who have no hope. Why did, why did my loved one who loved Jesus die? Well, they didn't die because of their sin. They died for the glory of God. Just wait and see. Just wait and see. Just watch and listen for a trumpet sound and you'll see why they died. Let's move on. Verse five says, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. That point is clearly made because when you read what Jesus does here, in fact, even what he says here, you might think Jesus doesn't love them. He behaves very callous towards them. Very callous towards his sickness, very callous towards their feeling, very callous towards Lazarus' death. It's heartless. It lacks all or any affection. John makes it clear that what Jesus does here is not motivated by callousness or indifference. What Jesus does here in subjecting Lazarus to illness that will result in his body dying that what the motivating factor is, is pure love. Which tells me God subjects his children to suffering and death not because of callousness towards us. Not because of indifference towards us. Every ounce of suffering and the eventuality of our death is appointed out of pure love. That is, the suffering God has ordained for his people and the death he has ordained also is good. It is right. And it will be glorious in his outcome. Despite the fact that suffering is not fun to go through, and I would imagine death is less fun than that. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister Lazarus, six. So, so based on his love, based on his love, so when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Based on his love, he delayed the demonstration of his power. You're right, Brother Dale. We could spend a few weeks on this. Because of his love, he delayed the demonstration of his power. He delayed the demonstration of deliverance. Not because of indifference, but because of love. God, where are you? God, when will you show up? Lord, when will you help me? Lord, if you loved me, you would show up. If you loved me, you would help out now. And all the while, if we would go ahead and read the Lord's answer, he says in principle in his word, my delay is because of love. It is not because of the absence of love, but because of the fullness of it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, his, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. And are you going there again? Remember, you read about that 
in chapter 10, verses 30 through 31. Jesus says, I and the Father are one. And they pick up stones to stone him. He says, for which of the good works are you going to stone me? And he, they say, it's not for the good works, but because you being a man make yourself God. Jesus has just left there. And he's escaped out into the wilderness. And he says, well, let's go back. Let's go to Judea again. And the disciples say, they're, they're seeking to stone you. And are you going there again? Jesus, are you thinking clearly? Because if we go there, they're going to do what they were seeking to do. And Lord, if you go there, we go there. And if they do that to you, what are they going to do to us? Lord, don't you remember they were seeking to stone you? Verse 9, Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. In other words, Jesus tells his worried disciples, you walk with me, you are walking in the light of God. You're not going to get tripped up in the purpose of God for your life. You can walk with me back into the middle of Judea, back into the middle of Jerusalem, and whatever befalls you and I is not accident. It is by the plan and the hand of God. You're walking in light. You're walking with light. In John chapter 8, verse 12, and Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness but will have the light of life. In other words, Jesus says, guys, trust me. Let's go back to Judea. We're not going to stumble in our purpose. After saying these things, verse 11, he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. Now that, that terminology don't read this anachronistically. That is, reading backwards. Don't read the apostles' theology backwards into the gospel here. In 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15, you read the apostle Paul talk about the death of believers as sleep, right? And we might read that and then read, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, and assume that the disciples here understand, oh, he's talking about Lazarus is dead. They adopt that theology because of what Jesus does here. And then later on, they talk about death of the believer as sleep. What is sleep? It's a temporary condition reversed by being, being awakened. They do not have the concept of death as temporary sleep yet. This is, this is why this statement confounds them. And they say, look, if he's fallen asleep, or our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, verse 12, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. They don't have in their mind this concept that sleep is death, and death is sleep for the believer. They don't have the concept of, of death being temporary in its condition. They don't think in that way. What's interesting is that in their own words here, they do speak prophetically. It's miraculous. It's amazing. Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will sozo. Sozo is where we get the, the theological term soteriology. Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be saved. They don't realize just how right they are. For those who die in Christ, it is, it is akin to sleeping. And for those who fall asleep in the Lord, they will be sozo. They will be saved. They will be delivered from this nap, but not this permanent state. They don't have that concept. Verse 13, so Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he meant talking or taking rest in sleep. Verse 14, then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake I am glad that I was not there. How callous. Lazarus has died. Lord, he's sick. Okay, I'm going to wait here two days. Lazarus has died. I'm glad I wasn't there. 
For your sake, I am glad that I was not there. Why? So that you may believe. But let us go to him. Believe what? Believe what? Not merely believe who, but believe what about the who. Believe Jesus, but believe what about him. He says, for your sake, I'm glad that he died and we weren't there. Why? So that you may believe. Not just believe in Jesus, but believe the extent of his power. They believe that Jesus can heal. Mary and Martha believe that Jesus can heal. In fact, the people who are gathered at the, the graveside, they believe that Jesus can heal. Some of them even say, can not a man who opened the eyes of the blind also have healed him? They all believe that Jesus can heal. And Jesus said, I'm glad that he died because your belief falls short of the fullness of my power. People are so desirous of being healed and wanting to experience the healing of God, the healing power of God, because they don't want to hurt anymore. They don't want to be sick anymore. They want to be healed. People who are healed eventually get sick and die again. I don't want to merely believe in a God who can heal me of my infirmities. I need to believe in a God who can raise me from the dead, never to be sick or infirm again. That's what I need. And Jesus says, for this reason, I, Cairo, I rejoice, I was glad. And I am glad that I was not there. Why? So that you may believe. Believe what? Believe the fullness of my authority. Not just to speak to sickness and it depart but to command death and life. This is what they need to believe. Friends, this is what we need to believe. Lazarus has died, verse 15, and for your sake I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. So Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Love it. Thomas is picked on, not our boy Thomas here, but Thomas is picked on in the Bible because he's doubting, right? He, he, wants to, he says, I won't believe he's been raised from the dead unless I can touch the, the nail scars and put my hand into his side. Here, Thomas is like, all right, Jesus. They're, they're wanting to kill you in Judea, and you say we're going to go? Suit up, boys. Let's go. We're going to go die. Let's go with him. Thomas is the one saying this. He's not doubting at this point. He's ready to go and to die with the Lord. In fact, that ought to be the clarion call. That ought to be the, the banner of God's people. Wherever he leads, I'll go. So what Thomas says. Let us go that we may die with him. So Jesus has heard the news. Not only that Lazarus is sick, but Jesus, in fact, is the one who said the rest of the news, right? Nobody told him. Jesus knew. Lazarus has died. He hears the news, and then he announces the news. How does Jesus know that Lazarus is dead? Nobody's told him. There's something about Jesus knowing all things. So he's heard the news. He's announced the news. Now in verses 17 uh, through 37, Jesus is going to encounter the family. Now, when Jesus came, that is to Bethany, he's made this 13-mile journey, 11 miles or so. Uh, now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Decay has set in. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort, to console them concerning their brother. What are these people doing? I'll tell you what they're doing. They're doing the best they can. They're doing the best they can. In the face of death, sometimes the best thing we can do is cook a pie, bake a casserole, and hug a neck. Brings zero healing. Brings zero reversal of the condition of death. But the people are there doing the best they can. 
another person is going to show up, and you know what he's going to do? He's going to do what he can, but what he can do and what they can do are very, very different. They're there consoling him concerning their brother. Verse 20, so when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. She was the one who was serving in the house, got irritated, agitated. She comes running to him, but Mary, the one who was sitting at Jesus' feet previously, she remained seated in the house. She's seemingly overcome with grief. Verse 21, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. What you'll see is in verse 32 that Mary echoes the exact same statement. Martha says, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. Mary says, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. Martha modifies her statement. She gives commentary to follow that Mary does not. Martha makes an astounding confession here. She says in verse 22, but even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Martha at least seemingly believes that Jesus' power has not met a stop sign. She doesn't know what's on the other side of her impasse, but she knows that Jesus is not bound by it. Childlike faith. I don't know what my father can do, but I know he could do something. Daddy, do something. Right? This is Martha's childlike faith here. Even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. In her mind, she has not yet put two and two together that Jesus has the ability to raise Lazarus from the dead. Maybe she was thinking the extent of Jesus' power was that he could give her comfort. He could just bring this comfort in her heart, in her soul, and make her feel so much better. That maybe that's what Jesus can do, is provide a psychosomatic cure for her ailment. He can give her peace. And can God give us peace? Yes, he can. Let me tell you, he can give us a little more than peace. He can give us a little bit more than peace. Jesus said, your brother will rise again. Martha said, I, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. She's believing. Maybe she had been taught by the Pharisees. The Pharisees, they believed in the resurrection from the dead. Two passages for you in the Old Testament that actually talk about resurrection from the dead. Daniel chapter 12, verse 2 says, And many of those who, who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Isaiah 26, verse 19, Your dead shall live. Their bodies shall rise. You shall dwell in the dust. Awake and sing for joy, for your dew is a dew of light, and the earth will give birth to the dead. Martha's believing. She's believing the word of the Lord. She's believing the promise that God will raise the dead in the last day. But she hasn't made the connection yet that Jesus is the source and substance of resurrection life. The God she has hoped in is the God that she is looking eye to eye. Jesus said to her, verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. The God you say you believe in, Martha, I am. And know my brother will be raised in the last day. By whom? By Yahweh. And Jesus says, I am Yahweh. We've seen this formulaic use of these verbs multiple times in John's gospel already. 
where Jesus makes declarations of deity, claims to his own divinity by employing this statement, which is the exact same Greek rendering of the Lord's claim in Exodus chapter 3. The Lord declares his name to Moses. Exodus 3, verse 13 through 14, Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask what is his name, what shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, Ego a me, in the Greek Septuagint. I am has sent me to you. In the Greek in this passage, Jesus says, Ego a me, and this day me, and zoe. I am the resurrection and the life. I'm God in the flesh, Jesus claims. That's a big claim. And to claim to be the resurrection and the life, you better be able to prove it. Better be able to prove it, and he will here very shortly. Notice two declarations Jesus ties together in one. The first declaration is this, that Jesus' resurrection power for those who believe. He is resurrection power for those who believe. He says there in verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. What is Jesus? Jesus is resurrection power for those who believe. Meaning, he has the ability, and not just has it, Jesus is the ability to raise the dead to life, and he employs this ability on behalf of and in favor of those who pistea. They believe in him to the point they align their life with his commands. What does he promise? He promises to use his very person, source, and substance on their behalf to raise them up from the dead. For those who align their life with his teaching because they believe. But this is not the only thing that Jesus claims here. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus is not only resurrection power, but Jesus is eternal life for those who believe. He is. He is the source and the substance of the gift of eternal life. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. That the eternal life of the believer is not dependent on events. It's not dependent on circumstances. It is dependent on the person of Jesus. And Jesus has died and been raised from the dead never to die again, which means if you have the gift of eternal life, it is truly what? Eternal. It is truly eternal. Resurrection power, eternal life. This is what John encapsulated principally in John chapter 1, verse 4. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. I want you to see here the necessity of both of these being true. That it would actually be quite terrible if Jesus were to only be the resurrection. If he were to only be the resurrection or if he was to only be the life. It's necessary for Jesus to be resurrection and life for this to be a most glorious truth for us. Here's why. If Jesus is only life, you know what life without resurrection is? Pointless. Let's eat and drink, but today we live and tomorrow we die. Life without resurrection is pointless, hopeless despair. You know what resurrection without life is? Torment. Raised from the dead to die again. Raised from the dead to die again. How long? 
will I suffer? Life without resurrection is hopelessness. Resurrection without life is torment. Jesus is resurrection and life. That's glorious. That's good. Jesus will raise your dead body to life and he will maintain your life in glory, in perfection for all eternity. You will die once, but you will live gloriously forever if you live and believe in Jesus. This is the conditionality of the promise. He says, verse 26, and everyone who lives and believes in me. This is not merely a belief in the mind and in the heart, but it is a life. Both of these are present, active participles. means a way of being that characterizes your life. Everyone, all who are living and all who are believing in me, shall never die. That is, die according to the common concept of man. A permanent final death. But here is the optimal question. Jesus says, do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe. Notice she doesn't say, I believe that you are the resurrection and life. She affirms Jesus' majesty and his deity in her confession. She says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ. That means you're the king, and you are the son of God. You are deity. You are God in the flesh, the one who is coming into the world. She's affirming all sorts of biblical promises here and all sorts of declarations that Jesus has made about himself. This woman has true faith given to her by the Father. Yes, Lord, I believe. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Marvelous confession. Let's see how... Her sister reacts. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, verse 28, saying in private, the teacher's here and is calling for you. Mary's hidden off, seemingly overwhelmed with grief. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and she she went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet saying to him, with all the crowds around, she fell at his feet saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Period. She doesn't add what Martha added. But, Lord, I know that whatever you ask of God, he'll give to you. Mary is overcome with her grief. She's overcome with her despair. To her, this death is final, but it could have been prevented at least for some period of time. Just, Lord, you could have healed him. Lord, you could have healed him. You could have taken away this fever. You could have taken away this cancer. You could have taken away this condition. You could have healed him of his cancer. Lord, you could have, you could have, you could have, but you didn't, Lord. She doesn't add, but I know that now you can still ask the Father anything. I think many times we find ourselves relating more to Mary than Martha. But I thought Jesus loved them. I thought he loved Lazarus and Mary and Martha. And yet he subjected Lazarus to sickness. In fact, sickness that resulted in him dying. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, it's the word clio. It's, it, it speaks of an uncontrolled weeping, a lamenting, almost like a screaming, sobbing. You've seen this before. When Jesus saw her, Clyro, weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, Clyro, same word, just uncontrollable lament, screaming, wailing. Why? 
They grieve as those who have no hope. It says when he saw her weeping and he saw everybody else weeping like that, it says he was deeply moved in my, which means intense, strong feeling of concern, often with the implication of indignation. The idea here is that when Jesus sees them weeping like this, it's not that he's just tugged at his heartstrings and he's just moved in his innards. Oh, it hurts. It's that when he sees this kind of uncontrollable mourning, it angered him. It angered him. My creation, weeping uncontrollably, not knowing the power of God towards them, not knowing the power of God towards the dead who believe. People created in the image of God, undergoing death. This does not delight the heart of God. It angers the heart of God. It moves him so deeply. He sends his son into the world to save man from grief with no hope. Not only does it say he was deeply moved in his spirit, but it says that he was greatly troubled. Greatly troubled is the word terrasso. It means acute emotional distress or turbulence. It means to be agitated. Jesus is irritated. He's mad. Agitated at the situation. Agitated at the suffering. Agitated at the uncontrollable crying. And, verse 34, he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. You would assume weeping and wept are the same word, clyro. It's not the same word. Clyro is the word used to describe the weeping of Mary and the people. Uncontrollable sobbing, lashing out irrationally. But for Jesus, it says, Jesus wept. Dacruo, it means to shed tears. Here is Jesus, even in his mourning, perfect control of his emotions. Perfect control of his emotions. Jesus sheds tears. He weeps, but unlike the weeping of the others. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. Some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Which of those is right? They're both right. See how he loved him. Couldn't he have healed him? Sure. You know what both classes, both groups of people are missing? They are missing the extent of Jesus' love for Lazarus. They are missing the extent of Jesus' power to heal. You see, they, they believe that Jesus' love would have prompted him to give a physical healing, but it is the pure love of God that denies physical healing at times in favor of resurrection. It is the love of God that denies physical healing at times in favor of resurrection. Resurrection is the true demonstration of God's power and love. Verse 38, now he's gonna go to the tomb. Uh, Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? She's worried about the stench of death. Jesus is going to demonstrate that he can remove the sting of death. Here's what she's concerned about, all that's physical and repulsive, and yet Jesus is concerned about demonstrating the divine power of the Son of God to raise the dead to life. 
Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Why? Why? I'll give you three brief reasons why. They rolled the stone away so that all the onlookers could smell the proof of death. So they could look in and see the proof of death. And thirdly, they had to create a doorway for the dead man to walk out of. So he took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, meaning Jesus already talked to the Father about this, when I believe probably in eternity past. Father, I thank you that you have already heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things... He cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus! That's how it's meant to be read. The, the word there for cried out is kraugadzo. It means to scream something so loudly that there is an unpleasant nature to the sound. Now, he screams out, Lazarus, come out. Can you imagine how humiliating it would have been if nobody walked out of that tomb? He just screamed so that less than two miles away, I'm sure the people in Jerusalem were going, what's happening over there? He screamed that loud. Everybody can hear him. It would have been quite humiliating. But what you would miss is the fact that everybody could hear him. He screamed so powerfully, not loudly, but he screamed so powerfully that the dead man heard him. Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out. How ironic, don't you think? The man who had died came out, his hands and his feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. It's interesting how Lazarus is described here. He's the dead man. Earlier, he's the man who came to his end. He's the man who had fallen asleep. He's the dead man. He's got to have people open the tomb for him. He's got to have people unwrap his hands and his feet. He's got to have people unwrap his face, and he's got to have people let him go. Friend, when Lazarus was lying on his sickbed, you know what he was? You could say sick, but the truth is, he was powerless. He was powerless in the face of death. When Lazarus was lying in that tomb and decay had begun to take over him and there was an odor indeed. You know what Lazarus was? Yes, he was decaying. Lazarus was powerless, not merely in the face of death. He was powerless in the grip of death. Lazarus has been raised up from the dead here, back to life, just like us. Lazarus can't untie himself, can't unbind himself, can't even create his own doorway. You know what Lazarus is back to being? Powerless in this life. And yet Lazarus just did something. He just experienced something by the powerful working of Jesus Christ that is promised to you and I. And what are you and I? Let me ask you, have you ever met a loved one? who was powerful in the face of death, in the face of sickness, who said, I'll be healed. And they healed themselves and got up and walked out. I hadn't met a one of them. You ever met somebody at their own funeral and said, man, that person's powerful in the grip of death? You hear people say, man, they look great. No, they don't. They look dead. Powerless in the face of death. All of us, what are we? We are powerless in this life. Jesus' words rise up. That's powerful. 
And that's what he promises to do for those who believe in him. Friend, you and I have no power in the face of death or in the grip of death. But by faith, we can lash ourselves to the one who has power over death. By faith, everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Jesus is the source and substance of resurrection life for those who believe. This is what we are meant to come away understanding and believing. That what Jesus did for Lazarus is a preview of the power of God that he will demonstrate in your life if you believe in him. Would you pray with me?